Um, I'm going to talk to you about something that's uh, that's very, very, uh, I think, extremely important and, and something that I uh, feel very strongly about, and that's uh, cabbage conduit choices. And we all have choices, so uh, the, it's really important to understand what we've done, uh, and that's surgeons, anesthesiologists, cardiologists. Uh, we've, we've done incredible work to uh, try to improve the outcomes of, of coronary bypass surgery. And you can see in this slide, and this has been carried out uh, over many years in the STS database, we've seen that the, as the patients have gotten sicker and sicker and older, uh, we still made the operation safer and safer. And so we, we see that despite the high expected mortality risk, there's uh, an observed mortality that continues to uh, go down. So we need to make sure, as we talk about minimally invasive approaches, we talk about different approaches, we need to make sure that we maintain that safety margin. Uh, this is the the standard conventional operation. You don't see this much anymore in, in talks because we uh, focus so much on newer innovation. But uh, the standard sternotomy approach is is uh, also an option for uh, multi vessel coronary disease. And you can see here that um, with this approach on pump with the heart uh, resting in a bloodless field, you can really um, do all the bypasses you need. <coughs> You can see here this patient had a, a vein graft to the right, a lemma to the LAD, a vein to the diagonal, a vein to an OM1, and a vein to a uh, distal OM. And uh, you can really do total revascularization this way. Uh, very important to keep in mind what are the real indications for doing bypass surgery, and, and this is the first step before you decide what, how you're going to do it. Uh, but make sure that you are, aren't doing bypass surgery just to fix a lesion that you see on, a, on an image. Uh, bypass surgery is always done to treat the patient and not to treat the picture. We know that um, we talked about the safety of bypass surgery, but the efficacy of bypass surgery is really dependent on the patency of the conduits. So you really uh, get the, the biggest bang out of your buck if you, if you uh, can make these conduits last as long as possible. Uh, we know that the Lima graft patency is over 95% uh, at long term, and study by Tatoulis was, was really uh, outstanding, showing that angiographic uh, study of symptomatic patients, these are the patients at highest risk for graft occlusion, uh, showed that the Lima to LAD was patent in 97% of them at 15 to 20 years. Uh, saphenous vein graft patency has been a little uh, harder to, uh, to follow long term, and, and it's uh, at one year, most studies show anywhere from, uh, from uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, occlusion rate at one year, uh, 75 percent at five years, 50 percent at 10 years. And uh, we do see patients that come in and all their vein grafts are still open 20 to 30 years later, uh, but that's a little bit more rare. Uh, the Lima patency, if you have a Lima to LAD that's still patent, even if four or five vein grafts have occluded, the Lima patency uh, still gives you a survival advantage, and you have to keep that in mind. Uh, early studies, these uh, studies done on patients who were operated in the 70s, uh, showed that patients who had a Lima to the LAD uh, did much better in survival and quality of life than patients who had all vein grafts. And uh, those studies have been repeated several times. Uh, now the Lima to LAD is the gold standard. We uh, uh, we don't accept if you don't do a Lima to LAD as part of your armamentarium if, uh, if you have that option. So w the, the reason it's the conduit of choice, uh, the left mammary artery is durable, it has long-term patency. Um, we know that if you use a Lima to LAD, you have reduced uh, mortality, superior early and late survival after cabbage, and uh, also reduced morbidity, decreased MI rate, uh, decreased hospitalization for cardiac events and decreased reoperation rate if you use the Lima LED. And the Lima LED is really used in 98% of the cabbage cases. If you're not using a Lima uh, as part of your uh, bypass conduit choice uh, and you're doing bypass surgery, you need to use the Lima uh, about 99.9% .9 of the time as, as Dr. McGillivray showed us uh, in order to, to be in stand, good standing so the benefits of the Lima, it's, it's, a, it's a thin walled, uh, less uh, muscular media than, than other arteries and veins. And because of the uh, thin walled media, it, there's uh, less propensity to spasm. It still can, you can still have spasm in the Lima, but, but less often than some of the other arterial conduits. Uh, there's also a less proliferative response to, response to mitogens. So uh, that helps with uh, neointimal hyperplasia. 
later on. You also have uh, a higher basal and stimulated rates of nitric oxide produced. So it's kind of like having an ongoing infusion of, uh, of good stuff into, the, into your uh, native arteries when you, when you uh, use this. Uh, and that does not occur with vein grafts. Um, you also get, uh, have, is, there's a non-fenestrated internal elastic lamina, and this in, inhibits cellular migration uh, during, during injury. We know that anything we, any uh, graft that we harvest, you're gonna have a, a period of ischemia and reperfusion injury, you're gonna have harvesting injury. Um, so if you can um, have less uh, cellular migration in response to injury, uh, it really prevents intimal hyperplasia. We also use these grafts in situ very often, which uh, decreases one anastomosis and, and less area for technical difficulties, and there's an excellent size match for coronary arteries. Now the weakness is, uh, it is a smaller capacitance vessel, so one uh, mammary artery may not, uh, may not feed the entire left side of the heart. Um, it is susceptible to competitive flow, uh, and that's very, a very important thing to recognize. Um, you're dependent on the patency of the left subclavian artery, so patients who have already had a left subclavian stent or have left subclavian stenosis, uh, the, mammary artery, the left mammary artery may not be the best thing. You can also kink the uh, artery if you don't take it up high enough. You can have uh, proximal intercostal artery steel syndrome, which we've seen on angiography before, and uh, it's got a close proximity to the left phrenic nerve when you're harvesting. You have to be careful of that. If you do bilateral mammaries, just be sure you don't get bilateral phrenic nerve injury or patients aren't going to be very happy. Um, this is a, a diagram, and I, I wish I could... Um, download the angiogram, it uh, doesn't exist. But this was a, a patient sent to me for redo coronary bypass surgery because the stent in the left subclavian went down and you can see these arrows going back. Every time the patient combed his hair with his left hand, uh, sorry, every time she combed her hair with her left hand, uh, she got angina. And so uh, she was getting actually uh, left arm use uh, steel from the LAD and she was feeding her left arm uh, through her LAD. You can see all the native disease here. All of her vein grafts were down. And uh, in this patient, uh, they wanted me to do a REMA to the LAD. Uh, and instead, we just did a uh, carotid to subclavian bypass and her symptoms went away. So that's minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Um, <laughs> so the case for using the REMA, uh, the bilateral mammary artery survival has been shown to be better than single mammary artery survival in study after study. Um, we know the REMA to the LAD, uh, in most studies, the patency rate is very similar to the LEMA to LAD. There's nothing magical about the late LEMA except it's on the left side. The biologic characteristics are the same in the REMA. Um, there's lower overall patency rates of the REMA than the LEMA, but that's because most people use the LEMA to LAD and the REMA to a lesser outflow target. Um, you also have uh, higher patency rates of the REMA than the radial or the vein grafts overall. And this is just a study showing at 30 years um, the uh, difference between survival of the uh, bilateral mammaries versus single mammaries. And um, Cleveland Clinic here showed uh, difference in survival over 12 years, uh, difference in reoperation rates where uh, bilateral mammaries was superior to single uh, mammary arteries. And uh, you can see the percent of 12 year survival and freedom from reoperation was, was greater with bilateral mammaries. And meta-analyses uh, survival, hazard ratio uh, survival showing uh, that favors bilateral mammaries um, has, has been borne out in several different meta-analyses. But despite this survival advantage and despite a quality of life advantage, only 10 to 15% of cabbage patients get a REMA. And so why is that? Um, a lot of times people are worried about sternal wound complications. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, in, in some studies there's been increase in sternal wound reconstruction and increase in sternal wound dehiscence in patients who had bilateral mammary arteries. Typically, uh, this is, is only, only reaches statistical significance in the uh, insulin-dependent diabetics and in the morbidly obese patients. So a patient who's insulin-dependent diabetic and morbidly obese, we try to avoid using, the mammary or the, the, using bilateral mammary arteries if possible. We've also found that using a skeletonized approach to dissecting out the mammary artery uh, actually can uh, eliminate this risk, uh, or at least bring it back down to baseline. 
So um, I, I do a, a skeletonized REMA dissection whenever I do bilateral mammaries, and I think that helps with your, uh, with your infection rate. The REMA location and length when used in situ often can't reach the uh, posterior descending artery. It's difficult to reach some of the distal left coronary artery targets, and it adds some time to the operation. The blue plate special of LEMAD LAD, a vein to the OM and a vein to the PDA is uh, very easy to do technically, um, but the uh, taking down my bilateral mammaries uh, takes a little more time. Uh, this is a study by Tatulis, and, and this was an uh, angiographic study showing um, the Lima here, uh, which has uh, greater than 90% patency over 15 years, the Rima, which has uh, about 75% patency over 15 years, and uh, vein grafts are, are much lower. So these are different configurations you can use. Uh, in this case, they use the uh, Rima in situ to the LAD, the Lima in situ around to the OM branch, and you can actually do sequential bypasses to diagonals and OM branches on the left side with, with the Lima. You can also use the Rima as a free graft, take the Lima to the LAD and a Rima as a free graft uh, that can reach all of the left-sided targets. So the conduit is important, uh, but you also have to make good choices when you use different conduits uh, based on the target characteristics. So the target artery, whether it's the LAD with great outflow or the RCA that has different uh, outflow, um, we, have to, we have to take into account that uh, LAD <clears throat> and non-LAD targets will have different outcomes. This study showed uh, different patency rates over 10 years' time, uh, dependent on the proximal degree of proximal stenosis of the target artery. So if you're bypassing the LAD and it had 100% stenosis, you had excellent 10-year uh, patency. Um, if it had 50% stenosis, still had pretty good, but you can see that there's a, a downward trend, especially when the REMA is used to a non-LAD target. There's a downward trend based on the uh, proximal stenosis, and uh, that's really because of competitive flow. You can see here in this, this is a uh, in vitro study where they mimicked the angle of and the flow uh, in the uh, vein, in an LAD, uh, lima going to the LAD, and you can see if there's no stenosis, the flow through the native artery and the flow through the lima are about equal. Um, if there's 30% stenosis, the flow is about equal, and you have to get up over 50% uh, stenosis to get better flow in the graft uh, than in the proximal native artery. Um, and here you can see um, at 75% stenosis, most of the flow going to the artery is through the graft. Um, and that's important when you start looking at, um, you know, when we, this is a patient I did off pump and he had a 75%, a 70% left main lesion and you can see the blood um, squirting and you know when you cut into these arteries and you're doing it off pump, a lot of times even with a 90% stenosis, you get hit in the face by the blood and you try to figure out, um, you know, are you going to really be able to keep that mammary artery flowing? And this is the result of 40% uh, proximal LAD stenosis. The uh, lima just never developed because it was not uh, sufficiently overcoming the flow in the native artery. And studies have shown that the right mammary artery patency uh, goes down as you get away from the LAD. So the LAD, the diagonal, the circumflex arteries um, have uh, pretty good results. The right coronary artery has uh, much lower patency rates over time. And you can see this other study showed uh, the REMA to LAD had excellent results because of great runoff. The REMA to the RCA uh, doesn't have as good results maybe because we can't always reach the, a, a good PDA target. Here you can see the skeletonized REMA taken all the way down to the bifurcation, um, even on stretch, doesn't reach beyond the crux of the heart. Uh, and so this is a, a patient where we used the, the REMA as a free graft, uh, FREMA, and uh, took it off the proximal LEMA. So where, when do we choose to use uh, bilateral mammary arteries? Non-diabetic or non-insulin diabetic patients who are not morbidly obese and they have good left-sided targets with high-grade stenosis um, and uh, non-emergent operations, it's nice to uh, take your time with this. Um, young patients that are gonna really benefit from long-term outcomes. Uh, patients who don't have bleeding diathesis, you can get a little more, bit more bleeding from two raw surface areas. Um, and patients who have a calcified aorta, you want to use two grafts in situ. Uh, the, the bilateral mammary is a good target, a good option. 
Now the radial artery, a lot of people feel like, well, the REMA is a great option. Why don't we just use the radial artery all the time? Um, and there have been some uh, prospective randomized trials and some, uh, some retrospective trials, and uh, we're still waiting on some more prospective randomized trial. But one of the, one of the trials in particular looked at uh, um, angiographic follow-up and, and grafts that were bypassed either to the circumflex or RCA, and they saw the vein graft occlusion rate was 13%, radial occlusion rate at one year was 8%. So they, uh, the conclusion was that the radial arteries did much better. What they didn't include was that at angiographic follow-up, uh, there were 7% string sign in the patent radial arteries. So if you add together the um, radial artery occlus occlusions and the string signs, uh, really a 15% failure rate. Um, so we know that radial arteries are more prone to competitive flow, and most uh, surgeons have advocated only using the radial artery if you have an 80 or 90% stenosis. Several have advocated only with a 90% proximal stenosis. So you've got to take that into account when you're choosing your targets. Um, the radial arteries have much more smooth muscle in the media, so they're much more prone to spasm. Um, a lot of people try to give patients uh, calcium channel blockers or nitrates from the time of surgery on. Uh, the problem is that uh, most patients are also on beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So by the time you send them out on beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and calcium channel blockers, the heart rate's 40 and they've got terrible headaches. So um, most patients are non-compliant with their calcium channel blockers or nitrates, uh, which puts the artery at more, more risk of spasm. You have to really test for an incomplete palmar arch, which occurs in about 10% of patients, and you can have median nerve injury, which is a pretty bad outcome, especially if you do it bilaterally. Um, here you can see the difference between an internal thoracic artery and the radial artery, and the media is much more thick and, and more prone to spasm. So vein graft patency we talked about, uh, maybe about an 80 to 85% uh, one-year patency rate. Uh, if the veins fail in the first year, it's usually graft thrombosis, technical problems, or the vein quality at that causes it. Uh, greater than five years, you start to see graft atherosclerosis. At 10 years, they're 60 to 70 percent patent, and most of them have angiographic evidence of atherosclerosis. Um, so the uh, late attrition of the vein grafts is usually due to coronary artery disease risk factors. So you really want to uh, try to ameliorate all the risk factors you can uh, when these patients have their surgery. Certain medications have been shown, uh, statins and, and maybe um, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy may, sh may give you longer graft patency. And these are some of the bad veins we find. This was a vein I took out of the leg, and you can see this was the very best piece of vein that I could find in both legs. Uh, you can see some of these um, varicosities are, are three millimeters in diameter. Uh, here's a vein graft that we took out uh, that had had stents, and you can see the atherosclerotic changes here with uh, instant stenosis near uh, 90%. Um, this was a vein I took out of a diabetic uh, dialysis patient and you can kind of see the speckled calcification. And I knew this vein was bad when we held it up after taking it out of the leg and I held it up and it stood up like a pencil um, <laughs> when it was completely empty. So this was a vein that you can see the little pathology marking. We didn't use this one. Uh, so why do we use saphenous veins? Well, they're, they're uh, an excellent available length of conduit. They're easy to harvest. They're a large capacitance vessel and, and a lot of patients do very well with them. They just have a, a uh, sooner they uh, do end up failing sooner. And we can enhance saphenous vein graft patency um, by our harvesting techniques. You want to avoid uh, tension, over, avoid over distending the veins, and you really want to avoid tension while you're harvesting and avoid trauma to the veins while you're harvesting. Tension over distension have been shown to kill the endothelium and you end up with a dead conduit. Um, the biologic factors of the conduit are very important. Uh, when you use acid inflation, acidic uh, inflation fluid like normal saline, study, studies have shown that this also kills the intima. Um, using no-touch techniques have been associated with better angiographic patency, um, and the jury is out about EVH versus open, uh, and it really depends on taking it uh, in an atraumatic fashion uh, by, a, by a good um, harvester. Uh, vein quality when you get it out is important, and, and external support uh, devices may be the uh, road of the future. There, there have been really good outcomes with uh, a later generation of the uh, external sleeve or vest devices. 
um, and this, there's some ongoing clinical trials that may answer this question. Um, some of them have shown 100% uh, patency at five years in, in early studies. Um, size mismatches is important as well for, for graft patency. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of, uh, of different conduits. And uh, this, is the, this is a patient that had a horribly calcified aorta. We couldn't really, uh, didn't want to put him on pump, but a complex LAD lesion, a duplicate diagonal and LAD uh, sizes, a big, circumflex, a big ramus artery that was completely intramyocardial, and a circumflex artery that didn't have many uh, good OM targets. So we did a Lima to LAD and a uh, Rima in situ to the big diagonal off pump and uh, did drug looting stents to the large ramus and circumflex occlusions. And this is a patient that had uh, severe left main disease and a tiny little focal 99% lesion in his RCA. And uh, this patient got uh, off pump uh, Lima to LAD with a uh, Freema, uh, free Rima off the Lima to the OM branch, and you can see excellent flow through the Rima graft, and uh, this Y configuration works really well. Um, you can see the, uh, the result there, and, and this is the angiographic result um, with a wide open uh, Y graft, and the patient got a drug looting stent to the RCA as well as a hybrid case. Um, but enhancing the graft patency, uh, you really want to make the right choices on which conduit to use and where. You can use a, a Lima, a Rima. The Rima can be used in situ or as a free graft. Uh, saphenous vein graft, keep in mind your harvest techniques and uh, avoid injuring the vein as you harvest it. Um, the radial artery is prone to spasm. Don't use the radial artery if you have less than 90% proximal stenosis and, um, uh, and some sequential anastomoses uh, really can help uh, out with small vessel outflow problems. Uh, my, my cabbage strategy, I use a Lima and, and uh, really in 100% of the cases if you can, a Lima to LAD um, uh, is to be avoided if the LAD is less than 50% and no endarterectomy required. You can uh, take the Lima to a, I've, I've taken the Lima to a more prominent vessel before when the LAD is very small and the diagonal is very large, for instance. Um, you can add a Rima in non-diabetic patients or non-insulin dependent diabetics who are not morbidly obese if they have good left-sided targets that are worth taking the Rima for. Um, you can do it in situ to the LAD diagonal ramus proximal OM1 um, in a free Rima as a Y graft or off the vein uh, or off one of the vein grafts or off the aorta. Um, in the last two years, about 38% of my patients have had bilateral mammaries. Uh, with no sternal wound infection, and I attribute that to a good um, uh, skeletonized Rima harvest. So just real quickly, this is the last uh, one. The STS clinical practice guidelines recently came out in 2016, showed a Lima to LAD has a class one recommendation with level of evidence B, and then using a Rima or radial as a second arterial conduit has a class 2A recommendation. Um, and using the BEMA with low surgical risks, low sternal risks, or using the BEMA uh, skeletonized has a class 2A uh, indication. Alternative conduits, uh, don't use them very often. Um, the gastroepiploic is, is more prone to spasm than the radial and difficult to harvest, and uh, um, that's only used as a last resort. So the conduit choice has to be selected appropriately and individualized to patients and targets. Uh, knowledge of the pros and cons of each choice have to be understood and, and critically analyzed. Lima to LAD is the primary choice for most patients and the use of secondary arterial conduits can, be, uh, can optimize your outcomes in properly selected cases. So let's make cabbage great again. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much.